Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Stefan Haggard. I direct the Korea Pacific program. We usually give people a minute or two to just get in to the webinar and make sure that everyone's settled. So if you'll just hold with us for a minute, we'll start up in about uh, 90 seconds. Uh, so I, I first want to say that this webinar series is supported uh, by the Korea Foundation quite generously, and we very much appreciate that. We're still in a position where it's hard to get people together. And in this case, of course, we're joined by some of our colleagues in Korea. So we're really happy that you're on the, uh, the call as well. Uh, next slide. I think that most of you know GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy. We have a series of degree programs in international affairs and a master's of public policy. Uh, we have a Korea concentration uh, at the school that Munsub and I direct, and that's part of the Korea Pacific program responsibility. So we do try to uh, cover the waterfront of different issues related to Korea including the top academic research, but also policy-oriented programming. So let me just go through a few things that are coming up in, in future weeks, because we've, uh, we've had some developments uh, that came to us that we just felt we needed to do something on. On October 11th, I'm going to have a conversation with Jeffrey Lewis uh, at the Middlebury Institute of International Studies at Monterey. Um, he's probably one of the top analysts in the country uh, of using satellite imagery for tracking uh, North Korea's nuclear and missile program. Uh, he's pioneered some of these techniques. He's really an interesting guy, very lively. And so that'll be an interesting conversation for us. It's more in the policy oriented area. On October 18th, we also had an opportunity which has come to us recently, which is Ko Yun Ju, who is a director general of the North American Affairs Bureau at MOFA, is going to join me again for a conversation on the current status of the alliance and policy towards North Korea. So that should be an interesting, uh, interesting session. And then finally, Terry Moon has this extremely interesting paper an academic paper called The Rise of a Network, Spillover of Political Patronage and Cronyism to the Private Sector, uh, with Ryan Kim and Jungmin Lee will be moderating that. Uh, Ryan will be providing discuss will serve as a discussion. But for those of you who are interested in the political economy of Korea, this is really an interesting um, academic piece. I'm pleased today to uh, introduce my colleague, Moon So Lee, um, who is an assistant professor here and directs the Korea Pacific program with me. And we're also joined by chung Lee, who is at KDI School, um, who is an economic historian and clearly has an interest in these issues. And I'm just gonna say about two minutes worth of, of background on this topic because uh, the heavy chemical industry drive of the 1970s in Korea is quite consequential both for debates about Korea's economic history, but it also has a security and wider political dimension to it. Uh, this is a plan that was formulated in Korea in the early 70s. Um, it was associated very closely with the um, issuing of the Yushin Constitution, which was an authoritarian constitution um, in, uh, in South Korea. Uh, it, had a, it had a strong but implicit military component to it, because part of what Park Chung hee was trying to do was to uh, develop the heavy industry base, which would permit um, a robust military industrial complex in South Korea, and particularly at a time when there were tensions between the United States and Park Chung hee particularly during the Carter administration, when this thing starts to take off. Um, but there's an, another economic reason why debates about the heavy and chemical industry program are, are really important for us. And that is because Korea um, later succeeded quite obviously in a number of these sectors which had been targeted by the government during the 1970s, including electronics, shipbuilding, steel, petrochemicals, machine tools, autos. Um, but the question is whether this government support for these industries actually had a causal effect on these industries and in what way. 
And so some have argued this is an example of a successful industrial policy, but it's also the case that there was a quite significant restructuring of those industries in the early 80s that was quite costly to Korea as well. And there are even lines of causation that can be traced all the way up to the financial crisis of 1997, 98. So I'm gonna turn this over to you. This is a really interesting paper um, which is one of the first, in my view, to seek to measure the effects of the HCI um, policy supports at the uh, industry and even firm level. Munson? Okay, hi, Steph. Okay, thank you so much for the great introduction. So do you see the, the screen? Okay, so... Okay. Yeah, let me get started. So I'm very happy to share this the research output with you guys in this the UC San Diego Seoul National University, the joint webinar. So for some of you guys in the audience who are not familiar with the, our webinar setting, so you can ask the question on the Q&A box. So if there are some the clarifying questions, the staff, the moderator will the, the ask the question directly to me. In general, we will collect all the questions and have a 20 to 30 minute discussion at the end. Okay, so this is about the effectiveness of the heavy industry drive of the 1973, which was temporary. I will uh, explain you why later. So this is the joint work with Minho at KDI and Yongsuk at the WashU. So during the East Asian the gross miracle period, the governments were heavily involved in Japan, the Korea, and other East Asian countries. However, so far there is no definitive answer as to the effectiveness of the ind industrial interventions. Um, mainly it was due to the lack of the data. And at the same time, we are also not planning to give you the definitive answer. So we will the, try to measure the certain margins of the advantages and disadvantages of the industrial policy. So I cannot give you the definitive answer whether the industrial policy was successful or not. But at the end, I will try to do my best to provide you answer what could have been done better. So this would be the goal of the, this research project. So in this paper, we are gonna evaluate the Korea's industrial policy during the 1970s, which was a really big push, the using the newly digitized plant level data. So I will explain you in detail about this, the historical the plant level data. By using this data, we will revisit the Korea's industrial policy because there has been the tons of discussion about the effectiveness of the industrial policy. Later, I will tell you the clearly the, the what else we can calculate the, using this new data. And while doing so, we are gonna utilize the fact that the policy, this industrial policy targeted both industries and the regions at the same time. So there has been the several channels to target the heavy and the chemical industries but at the same time, the government built the nine new the industrial complexes, which is constrained the mostly in the southeastern area of the Korean Peninsula. So I will show that later it is very important to the, the look at both the industrial variation and then the regional variation to have a complete picture of the effectiveness of the industrial policy. And by doing so, we will provide the First, analysis of the pattern of the resource allocation across the manufacturing plants during this period. So even though industrial policy is targeting the specific industries and the regions, many times the government is providing the lower tax rate or the directed the financial subsidy to the specific the entrepreneurs, the farms, or the plants. So that is going to redistribute the resources the, across the plants within the industry and the regions. So by having the plant level data, we will be able to tell you about how this resource allocation has been changing within industry and region. So let me quickly tell you about the summary of our findings. So we are gonna look at the 1973 to 1979 under President Park Jong-hee regime, the heavy and chemical industry drive. 
So we found the three things. The first, the output, input use, I mean the labor and the capital, and then the labor productivity grew significantly faster in the targeted industries and regions. But this might not be that surprising because the, we had other great papers using the industry level information and the papers using the industry level information also found the increase in the output and inputs in the targeted industries. We just add on the top of that, if you look at the targeted industries and reasons, both output and input increased. So our new finding is that we looked at the total factor productivity. So how the productivity of that the industries and regions had changed compared to the untargeted ones. So we found that the total factor productivity did not grow faster. So we couldn't reject the statistical difference. So what we found is that the growth of the total factor productivity in the targeted and non-targeted industries and regions has been somewhat similar. But then the question is why? So we looked at the individual plant. If you follow the individual plant, the plant level, the total factor productivity has increased. But once you aggregate the plant level up to the industry and the region level, the average total factor productivity didn't increase. Why? Because the more resources, the more capital has been allocated to the relatively unproductive plant. So even though there was the increase in the plant level total factor productivity, the more resources has been allocated to the less productive plants. That's why on average at the industry level, the total factor productivity didn't increase. So we call that misallocation within industries and regions across the plant. And another thing we want to look at at the end of the paper is the aggregate economy. So in order to, the, to show you the, the fact one and fact two, I will mostly rely on the partial equilibrium comparison, meaning that we are going to look at the difference in difference comparing the targeted sector to the performance of the non-targeted sector. But that's solely the partial equilibrium comparison. So it doesn't really tell us about the, how that changes the aggregate economy. So the, the last thing we want to look at is how the targeted industries that became the more or less important in the aggregate the input output structure. So we are going to show that the targeted industries became more important in the network of the economy. So that means the non-targeted industry has been benefited indirectly from this targeted in this the industry drive because the targeted industries became more important in the aggregate economy and then they provided the important intermediate inputs to the non-targeted industries the better inputs or the cheaper inputs in general so for the shake of time the i will skip the literature and directly enter to the our setup the Korean heavy industry drive of 1973. The sentence in italic, so this is the, the direct translation from Korean to English the, from the President Park jong speech in January the 1973. So he said, the government is announcing the heavy and chemical industry project. From now on, the government will accelerate the promotion of HCIs such as steel, shipbuilding, and petrochemical industries, and thereby increase their exports. So Stefan already gave you the, the, the overview about the, what has been behind this the, the huge change in policy, the big, big push policy. So it, our understanding is that it has been motivated by the two facts. The first, there has been the North Korea's the military the provocations, and then there was the partial pull out of the US troops, the, the, and there was the also the sometimes discussion about the, the, the complete the pull out of the, the US troops from the southern part of the Korean Peninsula. So that was just a few years after the end of the Vietnam War. And second, so the Korea was the mostly following the Japan's the growth experience. And Korea has seen that the Japan the successfully transformed its economy to the export-oriented economy a few years ago before this the 1973, the by promoting the heavy and the chemical industries. 
So the second motivation was the export promotion, and then the President Park Jung Hee get the explicit target, explicit target, and that has been the met by the 1978 or the 1979 around the end of the policy period. So there has been several various the forms of the targeting. So there has been the tax incentive and subsidized the, the long-term long, long loans, the targeting the heavy and the chemical the industries. And then there has been the policies targeting the specific areas, the, the, the mostly the done by the construction of new the industrial complexes. So the policy the ended unexpectedly in the 1979 after the, the, the assassination of the, 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 pres the President Park. And then the next regime, so changed its the gross, the, the, the policy as slogan to the private sector led growth. So this industrial policy didn't continue after the, 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 the 19, the 79. So let me show you the one example of the policy targeting the industries. So this is the effective tax rate by industries the calculated by the Dr. Kwok in the 1985. So we are looking at the nine industries and before the industrial policy, there was the little difference across the sectors in the effective tax rate. But then there was the huge increase in the gap between the heavy and the chemical industries and other industries in the effective tax rate. So the 1982, this policy ended because that's the year when the next regime, the Chonduan administration announced the new, the five year the economic plan. So that was the, 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 the policy targeting the specific industries that has been there for say the last than 10 years. And this is the example of the policy targeting the specific the area. So the, this is the, I'm showing you the map of the construction of the industrial complexes in Korea, the, the nine locations. So to support the heavy and the chemical industries so those, the, the places colored in red are the new industrial complexes. And then those has been concentrated in the southeastern area of the Korean Peninsula. And one example is Changwon. So the government decided to build the machinery industry cluster. So if you look at the other the cities, you can also find the main industries the concentrated in each city. Uh, the, in Changwon, the main the, the industry was machinery. So I'm showing you the picture of Changwon in the 1974, which was the typical the rural area. And then there was the huge transformation within just two years. The factories has been built and then inside the factory, the workers were higher than they started the making the machinery product. So this was really the, the, the massive investment. And then within just a few years, the government successfully the, built the infrastructure and then attracted the new, the plants, the farms, entrepreneurs. So, so far I gave you the overview about the industrial policy. So now let me tell you about the data we have. So this is, the newly digitized uh, the mining and manufacturing survey. So in Korea, even starting from the 19, the, the, the 50s, say the, even after the Korean War, the Statistics Korea or the Bank of Korea had a small scale survey. But then the question is whether we have the micro level, the data I mean, sleeping inside the library or sleeping inside the government uh, the, or not. So the fortunately, and then gladly, so the Statistics Korea, the recently the digitized, the historical, the micro level, the plant level, the manufacturing survey, the covering the before the industrial policy period. And then this survey goes until the, the, the this year. So we are using the 20 years of the data, the starting from the five years before the policy, and then also covering around the, the seven to eight years after the policy. 
So there are several advantages of this data. So this is the unique source of the plant level data covering all plants with the five plus workers. So this is the universe of the plants hiring the five or the more workers. So it covers all the, the big and the medium sized, uh, even some small sized uh, the factories. And we have detailed information on input and output that allows us to calculate the productivity at the plant level. And then we also did some sanity check. The aggregation of the microdata replicates the aggregate statistics because before this data became public, the researchers, including myself, needed to rely on the industry level information that has been stored in the, say, the, the year, statistical yearbook. And then we checked, we did some check, and then the microdata we have the replicates the aggregate statistics well. But this is the historical data. There are several limitations. And the reason why I'm telling you the limitation is because the, the, the depending on this limitation, we're going to build the empirical strategy. So the, our empirical strategy might be not so close to the ideal empirical strategy because there are several limitations in the data. The first two years are missing. This is not a big problem because still we have a several years before in the, the industrial policy. And the second limitation is the capital stock. The physical capital is only available in a single year before the industrial policy, and it became available at the later stage of the industrial policy. So for any variable that requires the physical capital information, I will show you the, how it changed from the 1968 to the 1977. So you will see the 10 year gap in those analysis. And the plant lab, lab AZ is only available after the 1980. So what we can do using the 1980 data is, so in the 1980, at least we can the, 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 the divide the set of the plants. The one group is the entrance during the industrial policy, and then the incumbents who are the old plants that existed before the industrial policy. So this is this distinction in the 1980, even though it is limited, is going to give me the, the interesting and meaningful variation in the data to discuss about the how the industrial policy affected the entrance versus the income much. And this data doesn't have a, the, the name of the firm. So, so we have the plant level information, but this is anonymized. So unfortunately, we cannot the, 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 I, the, we cannot tell you whether the, the, the big business group, say Hyundai, the Samsung, that basically the, that were born and raised during this period, how those the specific the business groups have changed over time. So having said that, so we are going to look at the difference in difference, the comparing the performance of the targeted industries and regions to the non-targeted uh, industries and regions. So the, the studying the historical documents, we identified the 15 out of the 28 the harmonized industries. And then we the, identify the three out of the 11 provinces that are targeted during this period. Okay, so how do we compare the performance of the industry and region the, between the targeted and the non-targeted ones. So I'm going to rely on the difference in difference strategy. So here, the left-hand side, why is the outcome variable I'm interested in? It could be output, input, or productivity. And then the, the independent variable, which is the shock to this the system, is the DIC, which is the binary indicator equals to one if the industry and regions were targeted and zero otherwise. And then we are going to look at the every year. So then the, this beta, the coefficient is going to tell us the how the targeted industries and regions that has grown either faster or slower compared to the non-targeted industries and regions. So this beta is going to summarize the differential growth rate of the targeted industries and regions, which is, at the end, the effectiveness of the industrial policy. So I will, from now on, show you this the coefficient, the summarizing the effectiveness of the industrial policy in the several interesting variables. The first variable I want to look at is the output, the real value added. 
And then this is over time. So the 1971 is the normalization, the before and the policy period. The one observation I have here is that before the policy period, there was no difference in the growth rate between the targeted and non-targeted ones. So meaning that this is the is helping us to make some causal statement. And then there was the shock in the 1973, the value added the output has increased significantly in the targeted industries and regions. And another observation we have is the what happened after the policy period. So there was the persistent effect of the policy. Even though the policy itself ended, the, the performance of the targeted industries and reasons didn't come back to the, its original level pre the policy period. So even though it didn't, the, the growth rate, the, the difference in the growth rate didn't the increase further, it stayed there, meaning that there was the persistent effect of the industrial policy in terms of the output. I see the similar pattern from the number of employees, which is the labor input, and then the real capital stock, which is the, the capital input. So I already told you that this has been known in the literature. So then the, what happened in the total factor productivity. So this is our new finding. So we looked at the total factor productivity. So the productivity meaning that how efficiently the plant or the industry set can the, the transform the inputs into the output. So if you look at the industry region level, the total factor productivity, it is the basically zero. And then this gray area is the, the, statistic, the standard error. So meaning that statistically, we cannot tell the difference between the targeted and the non-targeted industries and regions. So the industry region level total factor productivity didn't differentially increase in the targeted sector. OK, so why? So we first looked at the simple average of the establishment level TFT. If we look at the plant level TFT, there was a significant increase. So you see the 0.2, which is the bar from the zero, statistically significant, the increase in the establishment level TFT. So if you track the same TFT, I mean, and we, are, we are not able to do, but the, imagine that we track the same the, the plant over time. So then the plant level, the total factor productivity increased but more resources has been allocated to the less productive the plant. That's why we are seeing the no change in the industry region level productivity. So we can do more systematic analysis. So for the sake of time, I will not have a time to explain the methodology, but I can quickly give you the idea. First, we look at the top concentration. So the top concentration of the output and input increased more in the targeted industry and regions. So the concentration within this bean has increased. And there is the way to calculate the following the Shane Kleiner 2009 paper. There is the way to calculate the whether the resources in general has been allocated to the more productive firms or the less productive firm by looking at the, how the, the resource allocation it, it, it is deviated from the theory prediction. So then the standard deviation of TFPR, so you can take that as the degree of the misallocation in the economy in the industries and regions. So that has significantly increased during the industrial policy period. So meaning that the, the, there has been the change in the degree of misallocation within the targeted and non-targeted industries and regions, but within the targeted industries and regions, the degree of the misallocation has increased. The resources has been allocated more to the non less productive plant. But then the question is why? So we have a discussion in the paper. So the, the data, due to the data limitation, we cannot the convincingly show you this. But we believe that the direct and indirect the discriminatory support contributed to the worsening the resource misallocation across the plant within the targeted industries and regions. So you can imagine the rise of the Jaguar, say the Hyundai and Samsung. So they were ex experiencing the huge transformation from the light industries to the heavy and the chemical industries. And then it was easy for the government to build a relationship with them and then concentration, concentrate resources to these the, 
the entrepreneurs. But the the but the success story in the light industry does not guarantee that the he or she is the best player in this new industry. So what happened is that the resources has been allocated to these the transforming entrepreneurs, but this does not guarantee that the, the plant built by this the entrepreneur has the, the highest probability or that entrepreneur is the best candidate in this new industry. So that has distorted the resource allocation in targeted industries. So this is where we believe the industry policy could have done the better. And in the previous graph, we have seen the de decrease in the degree of misallocation. If I come back, there was the decrease in the degree of misallocation, which is different from the, what I found from the output and input. So after the 1980, as Stefan briefly mentioned, there was the period of the rationalization, big consolidation. So the, by do, the, the doing this, the rationalization and big consolidation, so the resource allocation within the targeted industrial regions became the, 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 the better and better, the allocation became better and better. So we can also calculate the economic impact of the worst and the location. So I will just skip the, the for now and then move to the, the discussion about the aggregate economy. So, so far we looked at the, the comparison between the targeted and non-targeted ones. The main message was that the total factor of productivity did not increase because of the worst and the location. But this doesn't tell us about the, how it the changes the aggregate the GDP because it is the difference difference comparison. So one thing we looked at at the end of the paper is the calculating multiplier. So what is the multiplier following the Budinger's paper? So the multiplier is the impact of the 1% increase in productivity of given industry on the overall value added of the economy. So how important that industry is. So we found that the, the comparing the 1970 and 1980, the multiplier, the importance of that industry, non-targeted industry did not change. But if you look at the targeted industries, each multiplier has increased by the 20%. So the meaning that these targeted, targeted industries became more important in the, the economy and they provided the better and cheaper the intermediate inputs to the non-targeted industries. So the, the, what I have shown you from the difference in difference, the comparison may underestimate the overall impact of the policy on the economy. So what we are saying is that the comparing to the previous papers looking at the industry level output, we looked at the cost of the industrial policy, the increase in the misallocation, but at the same time, we are also identifying the new, the benefit of the industrial policy, the change by changing the overall economic structure, the industrial policy may have contributed to the overall the economy. So the, without the full benefit, the cost analysis, we cannot again the, provide the definitive answer to the question whether the industrial policy in Korea in the 1970 was success or not. But that's our the overall assessment about the industrial policy effectively solved using the newly digitized the data. I'm very looking forward to hearing the discussion and then continuing this discussion the, during the Q&A session. Thank you. That's great. Um, so I, I've got a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, one, which is a reference to a paper that you might be interested in. I'll check and see if it's in your reference list. But for now, let's go to Jung Gun and then we'll come back because one of the attendees raises a very interesting question about corruption, which I want to come back to as well. So Jung Gun, do you want to lead the discussion? Right, thank you. Let me share my screen. So uh, I'm, I'm very honored and excited to be here uh, to discuss this paper. Uh, reason one, uh, Lino Kim, uh, he's my close friend. <laughs> and secondly, I, I uh, also made a, a very strong appeal to the uh, then commissioner of Statistics Korea because uh, she was from uh, KDI as well. So I'm, I'm really glad to uh, see this paper. And third, uh, my job here is to uh, teach and do research about um, uh, Korean economic history, even though my original expertise lies in American economic history. 
So uh, when I teach uh, international students coming from uh, developing countries in Asia and Africa, they show a lot of interest in the Korean experience. And uh, most importantly, they, they have, uh, they really want to know about the secrets of uh, industrialization. So the fundamental question would be uh, whether Korea industrialized successfully uh, thanks to the government support or despite its inefficient intervention. And because, as I said, because my original expertise is not Korean economic history, I've been a little bit reluctant to give very definitive answer to this question because uh, I was very um, curious whether the Korean success can be replicated in uh, different contexts with different initial conditions. So I'm, I'm, I'm still looking for a more empirical evidence about the Korean uh, uh, development. So this is a, a very uh, interesting uh, paper. And I always start with some uh, comparative historical experience because we all know that uh, in latecomer countries or catching countries, the government played a, a, a more a larger roles like uh, infrastructure investment, like uh, the author mentioned uh, the construction of industrial parks and industrial finance and protectionist trade policy, especially for the, uh, the infant industries. And we all know that the Korean industrialization is closely uh, connected to the theory of big push because coordination is quite important in this uh, large scale industry and between uh, different uh, economic agents. And uh, East, East Asian governments were really uh, particularly good at uh, making coordination between the public sector and private sector and between and the firms. And uh, most importantly, uh, the uh, traditional definition of industrial policy uh, is so much about selecting and uh, supporting uh, the potential winners. So uh, this, uh, th th this, this uh, question has been at the center of um, uh, big debates about uh, economic development and, and, and industrialization. And a recent uh, economic literature shed new lights on industrial policy. And this paper can be positioned in, in this uh, emerging uh, economic literature on uh, industrial policy and economic development. Uh, some common features uh, include, uh, of this literature uh, include that they commonly emphasize uh, the uh, efficiency in uh, production network as an outcome of the policy. And one of the uh, uh, leading examples would be uh, Ernest Liu's paper, uh, 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 a paper that is cited uh, in the paper, in this paper. And like uh, Record Juha's paper uh, that uh, examined the uh, temporary pr uh, protection uh, caused by Napoleonic uh, uh, trade blockade on uh, French uh, cotton textile industry. Uh, short run protection can lead to long run uh, industrial development. So the HCI drive of Korea uh, is in this line of uh, literature because it perfectly fits uh, these conditions. So, uh, but this is very highly uh, controversial topic uh, because uh, the Korean government was uh, already uh, heavily uh, involved in the 1960s but the difference is that um, it, prom uh, it promoted specific uh, firm activity, which is pro uh, export, and did not uh, discriminate industries or firms. But uh, HECI drive of the 1970s uh, is known to be very uh, discriminative, like uh, toward uh, larger firms and uh, very um, large scale economies. So Korean government concentrated policy, su uh, policy support on these targeted industries. And because these in targeted industries had the economies of scale and scope and techn technological complexity, there was a call for big businesses entry. And that that's, uh, is believed to uh, produce uh, what uh, we've seen from uh, Moonsop's paper. So, uh, but because many firms were highly leveraged uh, thanks to, uh, uh, partially thanks to the government support and preferential loans and many other uh, policy tools. They fell into insolvency in the 1980s. So there are, uh, uh, in, there, there are some divided views on the uh, effectiveness of the uh, H HECI uh, uh, policy drive uh, of the 1970s. So uh, we come back to this paper's fundamental question, uh, which is, does the industrial policy work? 
and because this uh, paper uh, can be uh, positioned in, in, in the uh, recent literature of the uh, empirical, uh, empirical literature of the industrial policy. Uh, I would like to uh, throw a question uh, because uh, the uh, ultimate question we face as economists is to uh, what to compare and in what. So uh, let me uh, give some examples. Uh, one of the examples of Lee Jong-Hwa's paper. So he tested the effects of individual policies rather than policy packages uh, that can be uh, named as HCI uh, policy drive. So he uh, compared uh, two digit industries, but he uh, covered a, a, a more uh, extensive period uh, from 1963 to uh, 1987. And he found no significant effect of promoting policies. And Yu Jung Ho, uh, who's from KDI, he compared Korea and, and Taiwan and light industries and HCIs. And he emphasizes that the H HCI drive sacrifice light industries. So I'm trying to say uh, that uh, we might end up with different results. Uh, and it depends on what comparison group we set. And one of the most recent studies, which is also cited in the Moonsoft paper, is uh, my colleague and Nathan Lane's paper. So he compared targeted industries at the four digit or five digit level, so very uh, uh, granular level. And he, and he focused on more uh, dynamic uh, aspects rather than static aspects. So he uh, examined the effects on revealed comparative advantage. So the competitiveness on the global market and the spillover effect in the production network. So he, he uh, emphasizes the importance of investing in upstream industries. So I would like to uh, give comments to this paper uh, in, in this uh, academic background. I mean, uh, I would like to compare this paper with uh, other similar papers and I would like to highlight the strength and I would give some suggestions to uh, what this paper can make some improvement. So uh, this paper uh, compares basically uh, targeted and non-targeted industries and industry region pairs in terms of output, inputs, labor, productivity, and TFP. But my impression is that uh, the authors give a lot of stress uh, on TFP, uh, if I uh, read the paper correctly. And the paper finds the positive impact on targeted industries, but no positive impact on TFP target, uh, uh, TFP uh, and targeted industry region pairs. And they think it's because there was allocative inefficiencies with the industry and region pairs. And it's particularly because uh, a large but inefficient plants are entered in targeted uh, industry region pairs. So uh, I, I will, uh, first I would like to give some um, uh, overall comments. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, what will be the most Im important implications of this paper? and what it means to the uh, literature of industrial policy and economic development. Because uh, the paper uh, presents uh, mixed uh, results. I mean, they find some positive effect on output, input, and export, but no positive effect on TFP. So it's a matter of what kind of message they're trying to deliver uh, to the audience. But as I said, I think they uh, put more emphasis on TFP and its distribution. So um, uh, my impression is that they give more weight to short run cost of industrial policy. I'm not sure whether they uh, actually intended this or not, but uh, I think the authors can make a, a little bit stronger uh, arguments uh, depending on what they really want to I mean, highlight. And it would uh, depend on the uh, strengths of this paper as well. But I also think that readers might also uh, wonder what main findings, what their main findings imply for the uh, ultimate question we had, like does industrial policy work? So uh, in that regard, uh, I can, I might ask whether TFP uh, is the best indicator to answer this question because in the end, TFP measures the uh, unexpl unexplained part and, and uh, specific uh, time. Uh, rather than its, its dynamic uh, capability. But uh, industrial policy, especially HCI, 
uh, was not designed to uh, maximize uh, adaptive efficiency and improve TFP over the short run, but probably uh, policymakers are wanting to develop a long run technological capability. And they uh, might have thought that uh, big businesses are uh, suitable to uh, take that uh, challenge. So that'll be the question. And that, that's the question that, uh, that is addressed by um, uh, recent papers uh, that focus more on long run performance and spillover effects. So uh, because one of the uh, biggest strengths of this paper is that they uh, is that the, uh, the paper uh, utilizes for uh, plant level uh, information and because uh, the authors are already uh, uh, took advantage of plant age as of 1980 they can track the performance of uh, the plants that entered during uh, the HCI drive over time because uh, we 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 are very uh, interested in how uh, the uh, uh, treated, so targeted firms uh, accumulated their uh, cap capability uh, over the long run and how they perform in the long run. And uh, we can, can also we, ask. Uh, can, can I just ask you to, to to wrap up in the next couple of oh, minutes? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We, stick, we yes. want to stick to the hour. We don't want to. Oh, yes, 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 yes. I think that I, 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 I talk too much. So um, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, more smaller points. Uh, I uh, wish that the authors uh, uh, use more uh, information coming from 1970s because that's, that's one of the uh, biggest contributions this, this paper makes. And because uh, this, uh, the main arguments um, draws on the TFP uh, estimations, we should think about possible problems regarding uh, TFP estimation and shakily now analysis because that relies on many assumptions. And finally, uh, we might think about uh, whether comparing Southeast industrial regions uh, versus other regions might be a, a legit uh, comparison to draw a credible uh, uh, results. Yes, so uh, these are smaller points. And here's my uh, 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 big point. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up like that, yes. Jungun, that, that was really fantastic. And I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm so excited about this discussion. I really would prefer to allow you to, <laughs> to but there have been some um, questions raised in the chat and I have- Yes, one yes, it's my duty to keep the time, so, yes. So let me, let me just pose some questions in the chat, Munso, and then we'll kind of give you last word and we can probably go over a few minutes, but let, um, Jungmin Lee asks, did you take into account the cost of industrial infrastructure? Missing this might overestimate the efficiency cost of regional unequal development. You know, that, that's an interesting question. And a related question from Jung Hyung Kim is whether the misallocation was, and I think they say at the plant level, but it could be only, you know, primarily at the plant level, the region level, the industry level, or at some other dimension. So um, I think that's, that's also um, a, an interesting question. Do you want to respond to a few of these? And then I want to raise my political economy question to you. Okay, so I will answer to those questions. The first of all, Changun, thank you so much for your discussion. So you were even better at positioning my paper in the big picture question and the literature. I really appreciate that. So let me answer to the one key question about the, whether the TFP is the best measure. So we think the TFP is the best, the good measure to the, the evaluate the short on the performance, the, like you just said. And then the question is whether this the heavy industry drive had a long term the purpose or not. So it depends on the interpretation. Our interpretation was that that was the motivated by the political economy situation and then the export promotion. Maybe the what the Park Jong administration targeted was the either the short term or the medium performances. And the TFP is less likely to be the direct target. So we are mostly looking at the many times unintended consequences. And yeah, I will be very happy so, uh, to continue the discussion with you, especially about the, the minor comments that I had, I don't have a time to answer to. And then, yeah, thank you so much for the questions that raised on the, the chat. So the first answering to the Jungmin's question. 
So no, we are not taking into account the cost of the industrial infrastructure. So we know the size of it, so which is the big. So here we are not doing the, the cost benefit analysis. So if we can come take into account that the, the, the entire the budget spent on the building the industrial infrastructure, and then the, com compare that to the gains we estimated from the difference in difference, that could be the, the, the one thing we can think about doing more cost benefit analysis, which is not what we are doing. And answering to the Junhyung's question, so here we are looking, yeah, this is great question. Here we are looking at the missile location at the plant level within the, the, the industry and region, relying mostly on the shank cleaner methodology. At Changgun said, it had the several assumptions, but that allows us to do to the measure the degree of missile location because our underlying assumption is that the labor share and the capital share is common across the plant within the region. And compared doing this, the allocation issue across the region, across the industry is quite challenging because the source of heterogeneity could be the anything. So we don't have a good uh, the tool to evaluate that very important issue. And then one question we had on the chat was about the corruption. I think this could be the one candidate behind the increase in the, the missile location. So the financial market back then was super incomplete. So, I mean, the, whether the government could have done better or not is really the challenging question. And then we have anecdotal evidence that the, the Park Chung administration actually had this the export promotion meeting, having say 10 to 20 the entrepreneurs he knows, and then the government knows and then provide the, the direct support and advices and so on. So do you want to call it as a corruption or not? That's another question, but that was the alternative way of allocating the resources the, in the country where the financial market was the very incomplete. So, but still the part of that could have been the corruption. Yeah, so let me, let me put the corruption question in a, in a slightly different way. I think Chang Gun and I have an interest in saving in, in the industrial policy finding. And I'll put it first somewhat technically in terms of heterogeneous treatment of facts. Um, but, but I mean, what I was really struck by in the paper is this finding that the adverse effects appeared to be caused by new entrants, uh, at least in large part. And let me tell a political economy story. And that is that people think that the, they always think of the Park Chung hee government as capable of exercising discipline over private sector actors. But what appears to have happened is that the government basically opened the door to larger chable to access the financial markets, even though they had no competence in the activity in question. And so that those incumbents who had actually been operating in the relevant sectors prior to the onset of the heavy and chemical industry drive, they appear to at least not have done worse than non-targeted industries and maybe did better, but the drag on TFP and on other indicators was coming from new entrants. And basically it's a kind of corruption story. It's not so much you know, that they bought you know, these, this access to loans. It's just that the government failed to restrict the entry of firms that were just basically getting free money from the government. And if you could say, I'm gonna build a petrochemical plant, then the banking system would fund it. If you say, I'm gonna build an auto plant, the banking system would fund it. But, but you know, these are firms that didn't know what they were doing. Yeah, that's a great point. So that story is very consistent to our finding and also consistent to our finding on the importance of the entry margin, the explaining the increase in the, the missile location. So, I mean, true, that's what we are finding. The, the missile location is mainly driven by the, the rise of these the entrants who are less productive, but surprisingly the having the too many, the capital and the labor. So even though we are not talking much about that the rationalization period, that rationalization period under the new regime is super interesting period because the, we find that the degree of missile location has decreased while the, there has been the persistent the effect on the output and the input. 
So that rationalization has been costly, and that there was the huge the distribution or the, the consequences. But in the specific margin, we are looking at how that changes the degree of the misallocation, that the big consolidation or the rationalization under the new regime has been successful. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, listen, there's one more question which we should ask, and I know it's a, a there are actually two, you know. Um, one is, what is the policy lesson that we can take away from this? Uh, you know, I mean, is there something? Because industrial policy is now bad. People are talking about this, you know, quite seriously again. And, you know, is, is yours a, an overall critique of industrial policy or more conditional critique? And then there's a question from Keiko Bang who asks, um, you know, this other countries question, but also whether Korea being a collectivist society had an impact on the success of industrial policy, which goes to this inability of the government to shut out the chable from participating, you know, despite the fact it's supposed to be a, a strong government, it proved curiously weak in allowing these entrants to you know, sop up just billions of dollars of cheap subsidized credit. Right, I mean, those are the great questions. And I wanna give the one minute to chang to answer to the question because this is, the, he said the, what he's teaching and then he also has the many students coming from the, all over the world. So this Korean industrial policy that has been used as a successful example, and there has been the several sub-Saharan African countries the trying to the, the replicate the, what Korea has done. So what I want to emphasize is that the, we should the, collect the, all the empirical evidence we can get, and we should look at the, all the potential margins that that data allows us to investigate. So we had a great the evidence on the industry level effect. Now we are looking at the, the, the relocation. Now other papers are looking at the network more seriously. So by having the more complete the picture of the in empirical evidence, we'll be able to answer to this the, the question better, whether the industrial policy is successful or not, and what is the counterfactual case scenario, the what if the Korea has something big. The different. No. I still want to give the one minute to Tang at the end. <laughs> Tang we have to give you the last word because your comments were so terrific. Well, I don't think I have uh, much to add, but um, I think the Korean experience shows us the importance of market based institutions, but at the same time, uh, the uh, accumulation of organizational capability. So I think the comments from Professor uh, Ken Lee uh, uh, speaks to th uh, this point. And uh, by utilizing a firm level uh, information, I think we can better answer like uh, how old firms contribute to uh, dynamics and uh, the takeoff of uh, Korean uh, industries or something. So I expect more research from you and me. Thanks. Great. Well, listen, thanks very much, uh, Anthony and Delaney. Thanks for sitting in. I think the conversation kind of went off, you know, and, and, and we got so excited about the paper that we monopolized the time. But I think it was really a terrific seminar, uh, Munsev, and this is just fantastic research. We look forward to seeing you next week, very different topic. We'll be talking about both technical aspects of the North Korean missile launches and also their larger strategic implications. Uh, uh, Jeff will be talking about the particular weapon systems and what they imply and what their capabilities are, and also what it portends for uh, relations on the peninsula. Thanks very much for joining us and we'll see you next time at the next webinar. So long.